and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Shippers? Here. Ellenboss? Ingalls? Here. King? Mayor Vulcans? Here. And at this time, if we could have a motion to approve the agenda this evening? I will make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Support. Councilmember Ellenboss? Ingalls? Yes. King? Shippers? Yes. Mayor Vulcans? Yes. Motion carries. At this time, we'll open the floor for our first public comment. We do ask when you come to the podium if you would please state your name and then write your address and keep your comments to three minutes or less. It's greatly appreciated. Anybody want to start off? Good evening, council, citizens, and my name's Randy. We'll do this a little big gig right here. I have several things tonight. Hope you can all hear me okay. First of all, uh, I'd like to start out to dress council, city manager, public works. Uh, kudos uh, for a job well done for our street department, uh, for what they're doing. They're out there plowing day and night now. So we're, uh, we're in a blizzard. Michigan winter wonderland, how beautiful can it get? Uh, and along with that, again, I'd like to address council, city manager, uh, finance director, on uh, keeping our sidewalks open. I know it's going to be a tough year, but citywide, for we can have a walkable community, it really, I mean, we got a foot of snow and I can't even. <laughs> but I guess we got to go to Florida. That's a trick. Uh, just a couple of things real quick. Um, I want to address the utilities manager. You know, we're in a hot spot in COVID right now, and a lot of citizens are staying home, and we're doing a lot of washing and et cetera, and doing a lot of work from Zoom from home. Uh, just to top off of my head, uh, maybe could we see the uh, – Water rates drop a little bit. I know that's a tough one, but uh, just an idea. But okay. Um, uh, to whoever, okay, and just a couple of quick things, real quick. Stimson Street, uh, by the Shell Station and Mitchell Street, there's a one hour parking sign that's been there for almost 35 years, never been moved. Uh, there is somebody parking there, and it is kind of a hazard because it's close to Mitchell Street and people are pulling out of the Shell Station. And the other uh, situation I noticed is that Mitchell and Spruce Street, uh, cars are parking right on top of the sidewalk almost to Mitchell Street and right on top of the stop signs in both directions. And if two cars, tr one turn off Mitchell, the other one trying to come up, uh, it ain't going to happen. Someone's got to give away. So anyways, basically, uh, that's what I want to address City Council. Um, and of course, on the marijuana ordinance, uh, we don't need to be tweaking ordinances and we need to leave them alone because these cause a lot of trouble. When we tweak the ordinances, what happens is a crime happens. And thank goodness for all these gentlemen here and our police, fire, and our other agencies. Thank you. Well, I guess I will get started. First of all, thank you to Robert Engels for the Go Blue outfit. I have my little M here as well. Thank you, babe. Wow. Um, I wanted to uh, address the um, marijuana issue and uh, just a, a couple words. The very large stacked grower facility and the word unlimited that's in the thing and it really has bothered me. Now, I personally did not vote for the recreational marijuana bill though I did realize a severe prison, prison sentencing for many needed to be addressed, and I think that's why it was cleverly included in the bill, and um, it um, made over 50%. And I realize over 50% of Cadillac citizens were in favor of the bill, 
I personally see a very definite role for medical marijuana. I have recommended it and when I was doing hospice work for ovarian cancer and other cancers and post-traumatic stress disorder and GI veterans in the war. Um, but um, I thought the pot lobby would be very happy with the two dispensaries we gave for recreational here, and the one Class A, Class B, and Class C. Uh, growers uh, facilities and the related establishments that they, they were given to each licensee. I'm not addressing their uh, mer medical stuff, of course. Now, we realize the um, Michigan uh, pot lobby is the, probably the most powerful in the country. They were able to get a um, uh, exceedingly low tax rate, lowest in the nation, and they charge the same amount, so obviously they have a much higher thing. And, of course, the pot lobby is continuing here now to uh, grow this large stacked, uh, have this large stacked facility in our own town where everybody can uh, see it. And um, uh, it's going to be in the only industrial, but it really opens up a lot of areas here. And currently, I think Everett is the pot center of uh, northern Michigan. And I hope we're not going to uh, end up being the same thing. Um, I don't think that um, um, the recreational marijuana has brought um, utopia to Michigan. It certainly brought a lot more multimillionaires and a little bit of tax money for the uh, cities too. I have two problems with recreational pot. It's very dangerous for teens uh, where addiction is a definite risk and if you have a smoke <coughs> in, at age 13 or 14, you're a 10% chance of becoming addicted and uh, definitely um, cognitive problems later in life and psychiatric problems, and I have seen, personally seen these here. And having a large stacked uh, facility right in our town uh, gives the youth the idea that this is a perfectly benign drug for them, even though the THC is massively increased compared to the Woodstock days here. Um, and um, Colorado has had, I need, to, I need to interrupt. Your three minutes is up. Um, there is an opportunity for more public comment during the public hearing. Oh, okay. So I can finish later then, eh? Okay, thank you. I wasn't certain exactly where to speak. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. My name is David Rosansky. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, I'm an attorney appearing on behalf of WL Green Ventures uh, Incorporated, which is a medical marijuana provisioning center permit holder. I'm here to humbly request that the City Council give strong consideration to increasing the cap on provisioning center and retail establishment permits to four permits each in order to award medical marijuana provisioning center permit holders with adult use marijuana retail establishment permits and vice versa. Doing so would not uh, increase the existing number of marijuana retail locations but would allow for a more competitive market within the City of Cadillac. Benton Harbor and Niles have very similar population sizes as Cadillac and both allow for four retail establishments within their respective municipalities. The city can take comfort in knowing this about increasing the cap. I ask you to consider the wisdom of allowing all four cannabis retail entities to co-locate with both medical and adult use permits. Loom and Dunegrass currently hold the two permits for retail establishments. Both entities are massive operators with a very su successful business model, as evidenced by their many other locations. They will take the position that the cap on retail establishments should uh, remain the same, but I strongly urge you to consider the consequences of not raising the cap. Not only will the per uh, medical permit holders be put at a ma massive disadvantage, but it is also likely that they and any future applicants will find this market to not be a viable opportunity. In states that have legalized adult use, the number of medical card holders substantially declines over time. Because the market for adult use is drastically larger, suppliers, which are growers and processors, increasingly focus on adult use retailers. As a result, retailers in the medical market can expect a declining medical market as well as fewer products in this market. 
Retailers who hold only a medical license will quickly fail as it becomes more clear over time. My client in uh, particular has already spent $150,000 on this project in Cadillac as of today. They're planning to invest more than a million dollars additionally to complete this project. This figure does not include inventory, which could be hundreds of thousands of dollars of additional investment. My client only has access to the smaller medical market, unfortunately. These numbers are of great concern as a result because of the return of investment that is now far more questionable than it would be if they were allowed to participate in the adult use market. The other provisioning center permit holder faces a very similar dilemma. If the city council were to adopt my suggestion, the benefits would outweigh any downside. The city would reap the benefits of additional tax revenue from the excise tax allocations, which no longer exist under the medical program. Uh, consumers would also be afforded more competition, which would allow for better market conditions for all involved. Other municipalities have given strong preference to existing provisioning centers when awarding retail establishment permits without running into litigation. Mr. Loransky, yes. I have to cut you off there. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Again, there's another opportunity to speak at the public here. Thank you. I just want to say I'm happy to answer any questions or address any concerns uh, later on as well. Thank you. Okay, seeing no one else, we'll close public comment <coughs> and move to the approval of the consent agenda. And this evening we do have the minutes from our regularly scheduled meeting on November 15th. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Support. Councilmember Ingalls? Yes. King? Shippers? Yes. Ellen Boss? Mayor Falkins? Yes. Motion carries. And so that will take us to uh, the public hearings for this evening. And so, Marcus, would you like to send us off on those? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, my remarks will be somewhat brief, uh, and they will be relevant to uh, the two public hearings that you have before you this evening regarding uh, our marijuana program. Uh, the City Council uh, essentially had first reading and set the public hearings at your last meeting. Uh, with respect to making uh, uh, adjustments or amendments to the marijuana-related ordinances in order to be able to accommodate industrial-type uh, uh, facilities within our industrial zone in the city of Cadillac. Uh, the city of Cadillac got into the marijuana business basically a couple of years ago in terms of regulating uh, and zoning for these uses. Uh, the city only created one license type for all growing type licenses, processing type uh, license, uh, secure transporter, uh, testing facilities. We really weren't, weren't thinking much about uh, that license type or those uses, but more so on the retail end when the city council created two license types for both medical and, recre and recreational. Those license types basically those regarding the retail uh, provisioning of marijuana or uh, dispensing of it are not subject for council's uh, ordinance discussion this evening. Uh, th that is something that perhaps we can revisit later this winter or, or this spring once we get over this, this current hump uh, in terms of uh, the industrial use. And it is something that we have talked about um, frankly, at your last meeting, I think I mentioned it as well, that it would be something that we would be looking at maybe revisiting uh, later this year or early next year in terms of uh, whether or not to, to do another revision. Um, but in any event, looking at uh, where we're at today, uh, as your documentation uh, refers to, we're looking at taking the cap off of uh, the license types that are currently prohibiting the ability for there to be industrial uh, marijuana uses within the park. Uh, and looking uh, at how other communities have done it, uh, having the uh, restrictions removed and simply renaming it uh, as unlimited is the best approach. There are uh, reasons why, and that frankly is because you might have one facility 
based upon its scope, might need 20 different licenses uh, only because of the, the way that there's statutory restrictions or limitations on the number of plants um, that uh, each license can get you. So the, the changes that, you, that are before City Council this evening allows for, uh, for that activity to occur. Uh, one change uh, that we picked up uh, just recently that we, that, we, that we need to also add into the, uh, the ordinance is to create the unlimited uh, ability of what's called excess um, uh, marijuana growing licenses as well. It all correlates to the whole cultivation industrial type, type center and the documents that were left before you this evening as well as emailed earlier include that, uh, include that change. So that, okay. those are my remarks. I'm not sure if, Mike, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think you covered it all. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> at this time uh, in the public hearing, we'll go ahead and open the floor for comments as it relates to this public <clears throat> hearing. And um, to let you know, if you speak during a public hearing, you actually will be allowed six minutes um, to be able to cover everything that, that you would like for us to take into consideration this evening. Okay. And there are two public There are two public hearings, and the first one here is the one to um, address the recreational, recreational establishments. <clears throat> Okay, well, um, I just don't personally like the idea of, I mean, we have the beautiful four winds and uh, wonderful industries here, and then, we, and then when we take our tours of our friends, oh, and this is where we grow marijuana. I just um, didn't think that that's what was originally decided. They can grow it out in some farm or something like that. But um, the, the impression to our youth is what I'm concerned about. And in Colorado, where it's been legal for years, <coughs> the youth, the teens, the young teens, adolescents have a 55% higher incidence of um, marijuana use. So I like to get the idea across that it's, um, it's a dangerous drug at their age. Now, later on in life, uh, it's n not nearly as dangerous, although in the Netherlands, they think 12% THC is equivalent to heroin. They actually officially call that. And so it's some, um, then the course of the that's the level it is these days. And secondly, I drive a car. And um, it's been very well proven that um, with tests, um, double blind randomized tests of, um, of driving a car, if you drive within four hours of taking a joint, smoking a joint, uh, you are definitely impaired. And in anonymous surveys, many people admit to within four hours and some admit to within one hour. And um, so again, I just don't think we need to, in, it's, it's just gonna be snowballing, especially that word which I do not like at all called unlimited, because you take, give them an inch and they'll want a mile. So um, there's a wonderful book by Ben Court called Weed Incorporated. You can watch a 14 minute YouTube of the whole book, but it talks about all the dangerous things that can happen when it's just, especially when k kids start early. And he himself started at age 13 and wanted to harder and harder and harder drugs and was severely addicted and then um, uh, got off of it. And now he goes around the country um, uh, warning about that. And we're just, we've given, I thought we've done very well in following this proposal to give two recreational, two uh, medical. And I just hate to see it um, happening. And just to let you know how, one last example, and I'll sit down, and how um, in Colorado, for instance, in Pueblo, they analyzed um, in a hospital newborns for one month, and 45% of those babies had marijuana in their, their um, umbilical cord. And just the idea that this is a totally innocent um, drug, that's, I am, um, I don't want to just open the floodgates, which, which I think that word um, unlimited spells out. Thank you. By the way, um, uh, 
marijuana in pregnancy um, increases, the, you get twice as many autistic kids, and these kids are going to be cognitively impaired without a doubt. Randy. Uh, hey, I, first of all, I'd just like to uh, say thank you to the police and all the firemen we have here tonight. Uh, I apologize that you guys got to wait for your recognition and what you do for our community. Um, so now, again, I'm going to come back and say no to this ordinance. We cannot keep tweaking ordinances to benefit businesses. I would like to have my, I'd like to have a tax break, uh, like we're going to be doing here shortly. I know I'm going off subject, but like down at speed, so I, I got own a couple of rental houses in my own, and hey, I'd like a nice tax break. To refer, okay, but anyways, getting back to marijuana, um, we should not, we need to resist the changing and the opening of more marijuana establishments in the city of Cadillac and even at retail um yeah maybe it will reduce the prices and they'll make more profit but this does trickle down i remember when i was 18 19 years old and i'm sitting out at 7-eleven asking hey buddy would buy me a six pack this the, our children in the community are going to get it and the worst thing again and i've repeated it on and on is that our officers and the fire and the first responders have to go out to where all these meth addicts are and they have to fix these guys up. They got to dress them. And this is what produces and uh, these actions happen. And then these good gentlemen that are here to enforce our laws, they got to go back to a normal life. And is, is that fair to them? What do they have to go through the rest of the night? They just saved a human life. Thank you, guys. <coughs> okay, not seeing anyone else. We'll close the public um, hearing and or excuse me, the public comment portion of the hearing and then go to any discussion amongst the council or if you have any questions for Marcus or Mike. I thought I would add if I if you wouldn't mind my members of the council the council that um, the city does frequently work with a, a private nonprofit group uh, that's been in town since the, I want to say the 1950s or 60s, called the Cadillac Industrial Fund. Uh, and as a part of um, uh, our collaborations, they are well aware um, of the changes coming forward uh, under consideration for tonight. Uh, and we're supportive of, of doing that and looking at trying to further encourage economic development and industrial development within our. Uh, community and so uh, area industry is well aware um, of what of what city council is uh, looking at and we got to tour the um, uh, facility the loom facility in Everett um, where they grow how many growers license did they have do you remember um, I, I think they have somewhere between 20 and 25 licenses including a processing license yeah it was well. a very um, a very nondescript uh, building um it was hard like to a, find it was, yeah it looked like a nice place to work um looked like any other any other factory or um industrial building that you'd see or warehouse so mm -hmm. um i think that was definitely um a, a good tour to take and you know i think this would be a good industry to have you know in in cadillac so they, they seem like good jobs the workers seem happy and um it didn't seem to be a nuisance of any kind so a uh, facility um, of that scope could bring a couple of hundred um, well-paying jobs uh, to the community uh, across a spectrum of, of uh, both white collar and blue collar type positions so and it's not um, I mean it's if you're driving around it's not like it's going to be obviously what it is and if you're taking tours even in the industrial through the industrial park I don't think it's going to stand out I th in any way it also will not um, a growing facility is not on the on the main street it's not 
promoting the product among the citizens or even you know visitors or whatever it is a way to manufacture this project product and this is a growing industry and it's highly highly um, regulated by the state and uh, I think that it's something that we should do here there are also um, to my knowledge no other industries in the city in which um, the city itself first has a sort of determining hearing like what you're having this evening to determine whether or not to allow this type or that type of an industrial use based upon its use and so the reason of course why you're you're having that conversation is because of the way that um, the state of Michigan and because it's marijuana established under state statute the fact that you have to um, especially approve licenses for this type of use but as we're very fortunate to have a very vibrant uh, industrial park within the city's uh, limits. Uh, they make a whole host of different types of products uh, that go to market. Um, everything from defense contractors to, you know, boats to, you know, wood, wood burning, you know, facilities that make power for the electric grid to everything rubber that you could find on a car. Uh, there's a, a whole variety of different things that are manufactured in the community, um, some that some people might find offensive, some that some people may not, but yet, you know, this is the only time that you're in a position that you're in where you're, you're making, having to make that determination about, about the use, so. And these facilities, um, a, 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 not a manufacturer, a growing facility, really would not be able to function without being able to have multiple licenses. Correct. Otherwise, you'd have a bunch of little fly-by-night things, you know. We don't want that. We would like something that is well-managed, well-regulated, and... And that's the justification for making the, the... or removing the limitations of having a capacity restriction is because not that you're going to see um, <coughs> dozens and dozens of growing operations opening in the city. You might have a few... Uh, but e and then each one might have several dozen licenses. We just don't know. And so as other communities have done so before us, you have to remove those capacities in order to facilitate um, the ability for this type of industry to come to, come to your community. So. Well, anything else? Mm -hmm. I will make a motion to approve the resolution to adopt ordinance to amend section 10-2 of the Cadillac City Code relating to recreational marijuana establishments as amended. <coughs> Support. Me. Council Member King, <coughs> Shippers. Yes. Ellenbos, Ingalls. Yes. Mayor Fulkins. Yes, motion carries. Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. I do not have a separate briefing for the second public hearing. The second public hearing uh, is in regard to the medical marijuana-related ordinance as well. Okay. Do we have a separate hearing on that one? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's yep. a separate public hearing, but there yeah, isn't okay. a separate presentation. So again, we'll open the public <coughs> comment as it relates to this public hearing, which is the medical marijuana facilities. Yep, it's me again. Um, what I'd like to see tonight, we've, we're missing council members. We should table both resolutions until we have a full council because we're, th we don't know what Mr. King or Mr. Allenboss's opinions are. So we should table these until we have a full council, which would be more appropriate. And again, um, we're tweaking ordinances. How wonderful it is to be growing all that marijuana and putting all these employees, hundreds of employees to work. What a beautiful thing. It's, if that's all we can consider, there's got to be an underlining problem or some matter under, underneath to have a facility that big in the city of Cadillac. We got them in Evert, Evert, Travers, Big Rapids, et cetera. Do we really need them in Cadillac? No, we don't.
I would say we should table all these resolutions and new ordinance adoptions till we have a full council. Thank you. Okay, seeing no one else, we'll close public comment and move forward with any other discussion the council would like to have or if someone would like to entertain a motion. Um, I will make a motion to approve the resolution to adopt ordinance to amend section 10-3 of the Cadillac City Code relating to medical marijuana facilities. Support. Council Member Shippers? Yes. Ellen Boss? Ingalls? Yes. King? <coughs> Mayor Fogans. Yes, motion carries. Okay, and that takes us to some appointments this evening. Being recommended to approve the reappointment of Mark Schneider to the Cadillac Historic Districts Commission for a three year term to expire on December 31st, 2024. Okay, I will make a motion to approve the reappointment of Mark Snyder to the Cadillac Historic District Commission for a three year term to expire on December 31st. 2024. And I will support that and also note that he has served on that commission since 2005. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Ellenboss, Ingalls, yes. King, Shippers, yes. Mayor Falkins. Yes, motion carries. It's also being recommended to approve the reappointment of Gwen Dubrovic to the Cadillac Historic Districts Commission for a three year term to expire on December 31st, 2024. I will make a motion to approve the reappointment of Gwen Dubrovic to the Cadillac Historic District Commission for a three-year term to expire on December 31st, 2024. I will support that, and she served almost 10 years, so. Councilmember Ingalls? Yes. King? Shippers? Yes. Ellen Boss? Mayor Falkins? Yes, motion carries. That takes us to the city manager's report this evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, the uh, first uh, request uh, under the city manager's report this evening is a request for uh, the resident uh, uh, or residents at 1401 Walnut Street, the, the Fiorovento family, uh, to house ducks. Uh, the city council uh, several years ago uh, put an ordinance in place that allows for the administrative approval uh, for uh, up to uh, six uh, chickens uh, or hens, no roosters, as well as for six rabbits. Uh, but the ordinance stopped there. It did not get into any other uh, livestock. Uh, a request came in uh, uh, from the family to be able to house uh, up to six egg-laying ducks uh, within their rear yard. Uh, our recommendation this evening is to uh, follow the ordinance that we have, which then requires city council to consider that request. Uh, our recommendation would be to approve it, given that we have a past track record of approving uh, requests for uh, uh, the six uh, egg-laying hens as well as uh, six uh, uh, rabbits. Uh, we did receive uh, correspondence from a neighbor across the street concerned that there might be uh, upwards of a dozen or so uh, ducks currently at the residence. Um, I'm, I am not factually certain if that is true or not. However, uh, certainly following uh, City Council's determination this evening, assuming that City Council does approve, up to six, uh, we will verify and then uh, require that if there are any more than six, that the homeowner uh, remedy that situation to make sure that there is only six. Sophie's choice for ducks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm, are the neighbors here that wrote to us? No, oh, it's the weather's out pretty bad. Well, given the fact that um, when we've approved these things in the past that I believe Mike Coy goes out and checks on things, and he is a worthy checker of things. <laughs> um, I, would <laughs> I would make the motion to approve the request from the Fior, Fiorvento family? Fiorvento? I believe so. I'm, yep. sure I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering that. Fiorvento family. Forgive me if I said it wrong. I have a similar name. Um, to keep up to six egg-laying ducks within the rear yard of their residence at 1401 Walnut Street and at night or during inclement weather like we have right now within a stall built in their shed. I'll support that as well. Councilmember King, Shippers? Yes. Ellen Boss, Ingalls? Yes. Mayor Falkins? Yes, motion carries. 
thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, since uh, 2010, this is the next item regarding the prosecution services contract. Since 2010, uh, the city and Wexford County have uh, been in a, a, a intergovernmental uh, agreement or, or relationship where we've had collaboration uh, within those services. Uh, it's time again for that agreement to be renewed. Uh, there are no uh, changes to the agreement. Uh, the current extension and fee structure for the contract does expire uh, at the end of this calendar year, and the recommendation uh, would be to uh, not make any changes uh, in rates or services uh, and to continue it for another four-year uh, extension. What did we do before 2010? Uh, before 2010, we used the prior uh, law firm and paid whatever the current rates were at that point. I will make a motion to approve the extension of the contract with the Wexford County <coughs> Prosecuting Attorney through December 31st, 2025. Support. Council Member Shippers? Why, yes. Elbas? Ingalls? Yes. King? Mayor Falcons? Yes. Motion carries. Yay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, at this point in time, um, uh, <laughs> we're going to have a special presentation this evening. Uh, from our public safety director, Adam Ochapka. Uh We're going to take a few minutes, and this is something that, you know, I, I, I wish we, we had the opportunity to put it on our agenda more, more frequently, and it's to recognize, nice glasses, by the way, it's to n recognize uh, our uh, police and fire uh, uh, officers accordingly. Um, when you are ready, sir. Mayor, council members, thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm honored and it's a privilege for me to be up here before you um, to recognize uh, some of our police officers and firefighters, give some introductions. Um, COVID uh, has really put a hamper on communications with council and being out in public. So it's it's actually kind, kind of refreshing to be able to do that. <coughs> Officer Dahl. <coughs> I'm going to introduce our, our newest officer. Uh, Officer Nick Dahl, uh, he was born and raised in Chelsea, Michigan. He grew up working on the family farm with his dad, graduated from Chelsea High School in 2008 and attended Washtenaw Community College in Ann Arbor. He then transferred to Siena Heights University in Adrian, Michigan and graduated in 14 with a BA in criminal justice. <clears throat> also a member of Siena Heights lacrosse team. He completed EMT training in 2010 and paramedic training in 2014. Graduated Lansing Community College Fire Academy in 2015 and from Mid-Michigan Police Academy in 2016. He worked as an EMT paramedic for Jackson, Michigan, Community Ambulance from 2010 to 2017. He's worked as a firefighter paramedic for Leroy Township, Michigan from 2016 to 17. He's also previously worked at Jackson, Michigan Police Department from 2017 through 2020 before joining the Cadillac Police Department in November of 20. He moved to Cadillac with his wife, Devin, because it's his favorite vacation spot. <laughs> <coughs> Currently, he's volunteer coaching with the Cadillac Lacrosse Club. Um, Officer Dahl, thank you for your service. Thank you. <clears throat> Next introduction I have is <clears throat> Diana Morris. One of the hardest things that we do as police or firefighters is, is be able to talk ourselves up. It's very difficult for all of us. <laughs> so uh, Diana Morris, uh, she began her career at the Pinellas <coughs> County? Pinellas. Pinellas County Sheriff's Office in Florida in March of 2016. In August of 19, she moved back to Michigan with her boyfriend, who is now her husband, because he wanted to move back to his hometown. After moving to Michigan, she discovered that she missed law enforcement, went through the M. Cole's recognition of prior training program, and became a certified Michigan police officer. She was hired by Cadillac Police Department in March of 2020. Diana, thank you for your service. Now I'm going to combine these. It was kind of difficult to figure out how we were going to put these together. 
but uh, firefighter Dale Hall, firefighter Wesley Owens. <laughs> Dale is an introduction. Wes has been with us for quite some time. Dale started the fire service back in 09 as a volunteer in Leroy. He is a third generation volunteer firefighter and worked alongside his dad with the Leroy Rose Lake Fire Department until coming here to the city fire department in 19. He also worked at the P Peninsula Fire Department for several years. Since becoming a firefighter, Dale has also received his EMT license, fire instructor certificate, and is currently taking college classes working towards a bachelor's degree. He's also a member of the Michigan Fire Service Instructors Association and has worked with the State Fire Marshal's Public Outreach Program. Dale worked at the Career Tech Center before coming here, where he helped teach public safety classes. There, he helped incorporate fire training into the class and helped plan several large training exercises where the high school students got to work alongside first responders. Since he started working here, Dale has had to learn how to cook, <laughs> and he's also become a pretty good baker when he's not a did someone write this for you <laughs> <laughs> when when he's not at work Dale enjoys spending time on Rose Lake during the summer and plans to be doing a lot of snowboarding this winter I'm gonna go over a, a quick a quick um, intro of uh, firefighter Owens Wes entered the fire service after high school in 2010 obtaining his fire certifications EMT license, fire officer certifications, and an associate degree. He worked part-time in Grand Traverse County as a firefighter EMT. While living in Manistee, he served as a member of two volunteer departments in Manistee County with Manistee Township and Filer Township Fire Departments, along with coaching swimming with the Manistee swim team and high school teams. Wes was a lieutenant and training officer for the Manistee Township Fire Department, where he, among others, impacted new training standards and practices to improve department professionalism and safety. In 14, he was awarded Outstanding Young Public Service Provider by the Manistee JCs. He was then hired with the City of Cadillac in 2017, where he serves as a full-time fireman. During his time with the city, he has assisted with imp impl implementing a water rescue program and policy and has recently been nominated at Union President for the Cadillac Firefighters Local 704. He currently lives in the city of Cadillac with his girlfriend and three dogs. He greatly enjoys working for the fire department and spending time out of work with friends and family. Which brings us to the first awards. <clears throat> the morning of September 29th, 2020, at approximately 9.25 in the morning, the Cadillac Fire Department was dispatched to a report of a structure fire at 1224 Dandy Street in the city of Cadillac. Upon arrival, firefighters noticed a large amount of smoke billowing from the single-story residential structure. A neighbor reported to firefighters that there was an elderly gentleman still inside the residence. <clears throat> Outfitted in their turnout gear and SCBA, firefighters Wesley Owens and firefighter Dale Hall immediately entered and began the search of the residence. As their search progressed, firefighter Owens and firefighter Hall entered a bedroom where the victim was laying on the floor next to his bed. Firefighter Owens and firefighter Hall were able to remove the victim. <clears throat> now, I'm reading off a piece of paper, but I'll tell you, the kitchen was fully involved and the bedroom was off the kitchen. They went through the fully involved flames to get to the bedroom where they pulled, um, they pulled the elderly gentleman out of the burning structure. Um, the victim was brought out to safety where he was treated and transported by EMS and later released from the hospital. The quick actions of Firefighter Owens and Firefighter Hall, along with their performance above and beyond the call of duty at extreme personal risk, were instrumental in the rescuing and saving of another person's life. For this, the Cadillac Fire Department and the City of Cadillac are awarding the most sacred of all medals, the Life Saving Awards. Firefighter Dale, thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Lord. Next, Sergeant Bertram. Mm -hmm. 
Sergeant Bertram is a husband of 17 years to his wife, Lindsay Bertram, and they have two teenage children. They live in Cadillac area since he was hired by the Cadillac Police Department in 2007. Nick was a police officer for two years in the Upper Peninsula prior to his service with the city. He has served in multiple disciplines within the police department, including the emergency response team, firearms instructor, evidence technician, and drug recognition expert. He was promoted to the rank of sergeant in 2017, and his time off, Sergeant Bertram enjoys spending time with his family and participating in various sporting events. On April 4th, 2021, Cadillac Police Department was advised of a homicide suspect near the Cadillac area. Sergeant Bertram located the suspect vehicle, activated his emergency lights and sirens in an attempt to stop the suspect. The homicide suspect led Sergeant Bertram on a high-speed pursuit. <clears throat> During this time, the suspect had fired multiple rounds at Sergeant Bertram through the suspect's rear window. Without regards for his own safety, Sergeant Bertram continued the pursuit. The suspect ditched his vehicle in a dealership and fled on foot into a nearby golf course. Sergeant Bertram directed incoming patrols and secured a perimeter around the scene. The suspect was later found deceased from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Sergeant Bertram's courage under fire and his ability to maintain a commanding presence is no less than exemplary. For these acts, we are hereby awarding Sergeant Bertram with a Medal of Bravery. Sergeant Bertram. Thank you. <laughs> Deputy Chief. <clears throat> Last but not least, very much not least. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Eric Eller's biography. He was born and raised in the Alpena area. He graduated from Alpena High School in 1990. He graduated from Lake Superior State University in 94 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in law enforcement. In August of 94, he was hired part-time with the Alpena County Sheriff's Department. In March of 95, he started full-time with the Eastern Michigan University Police Department and in July of 95, he accepted a position with the Cadillac Police Department. He's been an evidence tech, a member of the emergency response team, accident reconstructionist, school liaison officer, property room manager, and FTO, field training officer. In February of 07, he was promoted to sergeant, and in 16, he was promoted to captain. He is on the CTC Public Safety Advisory Board and serves on the board of directors for OASIS. He's a graduate of the Law Enforcement Executive Leader Institute. By the way, he graduated top of his class, but he won't say that. <laughs> Mackin Law Basic and Advanced Supervision School, Michigan Chiefs of Police Executives and New Chief School, and the National Command and Staff College Command and Staff Leadership Program. He has currently served with the City of Cadillac and the Citizens for the last 26 years and five months. <clears throat> Eric Eller has served the citizens of Cadillac for 27 years, holding nearly every position in the department to include interim chief of police. Eric has a record of outstanding services to the citizens of Cadillac. In September of 2020, Captain Eller was promoted to deputy chief of police. He currently advises me in operational activities, policy administration, and personnel matters. DC Eller has more than earned his promotion, and I'm glad to be a part of recognizing his accomplishments. Deputy Chief Eller, congratulations and thank you for your service to the city of Cadillac. <clears throat> and that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. Again, really appreciate everyone's time uh, in regard to acknowledging. Uh, some of the very special activities uh, of our police and fire departments and of course uh, the special recognition uh, for some of the uh, uh, things that they've accomplished uh, in terms of life-saving uh, and bravery as we learned uh, this this evening uh, this next item uh, is another special recognition item uh, and this is uh, in regard to the government finance officers association of america distinguished budget presentation awards program uh, and I have uh, a few remarks that I prepared before I, I kick this over to, uh, to Owen uh, that I'd like to, to just kind of run through. Um, uh, the city of Cadillac, for the last 38 consecutive years, and I'll repeat that, for the last 38 
consecutive years has received the annual Government Finance Officers Association of America, or GFOA, uh, Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. And for the last 36 consecutive years, uh, received the equivalent award for the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Uh, these awards are determined based on an examination of our documents uh, by a panel of independent reviewers. Uh, uh, they are the highest awards achievable, the highest form of recognition in governmental budgeting nationally, and according to the GFOA, uh, represent a significant achievement by our organization. Additionally, for the first time ever, our city received and again, for the first time ever, our city received special recognition for our annual budget, specifically uh, under the section regarding performance measures. Uh, as members of council know, our, our process begins with and, and ends with you. Um, you know, city council's engagement with our professional staff as a part of our annual budgeting process is, is invaluable. It, it enables our organization to utilize the tools that we have to create the financial documents you know, that are ultimately used by every department of the city and, and of course, are available to the public, too. These, these documents are very easily accessible just by going to our website, or if you don't have Internet access, you can come in and, and we're happy to, to share with you what, whatever it is you might be looking for. Um, so as I thank everyone on council, you know, for council's continued, you know, support, I, I really need to especially thank our finance director, Owen Roberts, uh, and, our, and our accounting manager, Carol Pacella, uh, for their tireless efforts every year in creating the final products that, that then have become, you know, basically uh, uh, treasures nationally for people to model their documents after. Uh, and so with, with those remarks, I'm now going to turn it over to our finance director, to Owen, if you would. Okay, did you want there? to see the video first? Is that? Yeah, sure. Yep. Okay, yep. so the... Uh, this year, as part of that, you know. By, by the way, thank you. And I just have a few a few comments to make on that. But I um, wanted to show you this video. I was hoping this would be a little bit more personalized um, for us. But this this came from the GFOA, and really it mentions Cadillac and the ribbon, and it's kind of pre-recorded. But it just kind of highlights uh, from the the national director of the GFOA what it what it really means to to do this. Greetings from the Government Finance Officers Association. I'm Chris Morrill, GFOA's executive director. It is my honor to recognize you for receiving the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. The purpose of this award program is to encourage and assist governments to prepare comprehensive and understandable budget documents that we believe will both improve transparency and trust in government. To earn the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award, you met demanding program criteria. Such a record reflects the professionalism, commitment, and dedication of your organization's leaders and finance team. We hope that this award will serve as an example and encourage others to strive for the same high standards in their own budget documents. Therefore, it is my privilege, on behalf of the Government Finance Officers Association, to present to you this Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. Congratulations. Greetings from the Government Once is enough. <laughs> so um, first I want to start off by saying um, you know this started 38 years ago and I was a happy-go-lucky sixth grader at 12 years old at the time so I, you know I had no part in 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 starting the excellence uh, of of what represents uh, this award for the city of Cadillac so my predecessor uh, Dale Walker just want to give him um, just a special recognition as well for uh, taking the initiative uh, really to begin that for the first time both on the budget uh, and the and the audit report um, in the in the video he mentioned the the two words trust and transparency and that this really should be an assurance of that I think to our community and I think when you look at um, some of the the things that we hear negatively um, what you hear is the opposite of those words um, kind of untrustworthy and not transparent and i think what we do with these documents and the easy access that we try to give to them uh, makes it uh, something where where it really represents i think the um, really the the prime example of what trustworthy and transparency really looks like so that really is the really the impetus behind um, uh, continuing to undergo these processes. It adds 
uh, dozens, if not, you know, a hundred or more pages to our documents, and they can be a little bit intimidating at times. We're, you know, we're, we're always happy to help walk people through that information, but really it represents something where if you want to know it about the finances of the city, uh, you really can find it in what we publish uh, and make publicly available and have multiple, multiple uh, public meetings and discussions about. So uh, it's also not a one department or a one person uh, effort. Um, Carol really is uh, is somebody that I just rely on time and time and time again. Uh, quality control, putting together numbers, uh, just just helping um, fix my mistakes and um, you know just provide quality information and communication of that as well. And so I just really appreciate that from from her perspective. Couldn't do that without uh, having her kind of holding up the arms a little bit. Um, and then the whole team as well. Marcus said it's, it starts and ends with council, and that really is true. Um, I think we talk about these awards every year. Um, I wanted, you know, as Marcus and I talked about it, we really want to do this just for the public's benefit. You know, we, we put the plaques on the wall every year um, and, and add the years to the plaques, and I think it can, can kind of become just routine to say, yeah, we get the award and we get that every year. Uh, there are 1,700 uh, units of government, including counties, schools, cities, townships, uh, in the country uh, that get this award. Um, there are 38 of those in the state of Michigan out of about uh, almost 1,300 um, cities, village, townships. Um, and so I think it really is something that's, that's noteworthy, uh, not to me as a person, not to our department uh, individually, but for our city as a whole and so we, I think it's just a really good news uh, for the right reason kind of thing that we really are committed to being open honest transparent uh, with the numbers that come through here and we really want people to know that and we're always happy to to talk about these things with with members of the public so thank you for allowing us uh, this time and uh, uh, this kind of special recognition well, I think that there should be another round of applause for that. <laughs> okay. Give them a raise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're gonna talk. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a recommendation regarding a premium payment for all full-time employees. As the City Council packet uh, includes a council communication um, uh, starts talking about uh, how over the last couple of years the city um, and not just the city but the world has been embroiled in the, the, the global uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic which has obviously impacted hundreds of millions of people uh, worldwide. Um, what I know that council uh, has been briefed on in the past at least through uh, COVID related updates that we used to do when they were on our agenda, uh, nearly uh, uh, all of our employees uh, were classified as essential workers uh, during the lockdowns uh, and the partial lockdowns uh, that um, went through our, our state. If, if we can all recall back to not that long ago, there were a host of different level, levels and layers of, of lockdown. Uh, and as such, uh, worked many uh, hours throughout that time uh, of the pandemic thus far, and certainly we continue to, to work through it as well. Um, uh, the city uh, during that time also chose not to take any action uh, with regard to additional compensation uh, to those employees. And so uh, in other uh, municipalities throughout the state of Michigan and certainly throughout the country, uh, there were different um, options uh, available. Uh, one option would be to essentially um, uh, adjust an employee's compensation so that they could then be eligible for uh, unemployment uh, to then make up for that difference in adjustment, but also at the same time become eligible for uh, what was quite uh, an enhancement to the unemployment program. Uh, I, I don't have that number uh, in front of me at this moment, but I, I believe it may have been uh, over $600 uh, difference uh, uh, each time an unemployment uh, compensation check was sent out. And again, none of our employees within uh, Cadillac were, were put on that program, even though there were other municipalities that were able to, uh, uh, to take advantage of that. 
Uh, additionally, in looking at uh, our current state uh, of finances, uh, the city um, at this point is nearly a million dollars uh, in the black, uh, and that doesn't even take into consideration the additional uh, million one uh, that is coming our way uh, through the, the Federal America Recovery uh, Program Act, uh, or ARPA, that you might be more familiar with. Um, also, in looking at what uh, the other largest uh, local unit of government, um, which is, I should say, the, local, the other largest unit of government uh, in our area, which is Wexford County, uh, has done, uh, they have looked uh, and have implemented putting in a $7,500 premium pay adjustment uh, for all of their uh, employees uh, over a three-year period uh, and have just basically uh, reduce that to uh, 2,500 a year every year for the next um, for the next three years. Um, obviously, as we have talked about in the past, we're certainly concerned about retention, uh, uh, recruitment. Uh, not that this is necessarily a recruitment tool per se, because this is a one-time only recommendation based upon one-time only dollars that we have available. Uh, but we are looking at the recommendation this evening. Uh, of a $1,500 premium pay adjustment for all city uh, employees uh, and to authorize the mayor to execute any employment agreement documentation required to facilitate those payments. Well, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I would just like to um, thank the staff and all the employees of the city for such an amazing job these past couple of years when things got really tough and and as Marcus said others were able to take partial furloughs and get extra payment for that and 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 you folks just just were able to go with the flow and make sure that what needed to happen happens and I just really appreciate that and um, speaking for my neighbors and my family um, we really appreciate that we could count on the fact that you all were here throughout all of that. Um, I think this is the least we could do. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a, a very reasonable reasonable ask, and it's not unique. Um, it might sound unique to some people, but it is not unique as we've come through this um, last almost two years of COVID. Um, there's many organizations um, doing the same thing for their employees and so I would echo uh, what uh, council member shippers um, has said about uh, being grateful knowing that our police and our fire and our city staff were there for the community throughout the pandemic and that you'll continue to be so thank you it ain't over yet no. <laughs> please <Nope>. no <clears throat> um I would like to make a motion to approve a premium payment of $1,500 per employee and authorize the mayor to execute any employment agreement documentation <coughs> required to facilitate those payments. Support. Councilmember Ellenboss, Ingalls? Yes. King? Shippers? Yes. Mayor Falcons? Yes. Motion carries. Can we, um, when will they be getting their payments or these payments? Before the end of the calendar year, okay. possibly by the end of this week. Oh, that would be lovely. Before Christmas would mm -hmm. be great if it was the 17th. Christmas. Great. 17th. 17th? Good day. Yeah, 17th. That's great. Good job, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Since we're clapping a lot tonight. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much, um, Mayor and members of City Council. Um, certainly very much appreciated uh, your all of your continued uh, support. Um, and I, I know, speaking on behalf of staff, we're all very um, gracious for that. Uh, the next uh, three items I'm going to cover all in one. Um, they are related to a redevelopment of 423 North Mitchell Street, uh, more commonly known as, as where the former Speeds Automotive uh, facility is. Uh, if you were to uh, look at the council uh, communication, uh, under the recommended action, it actually summarizes what these documents are. Uh, and so the resolutions before you this evening 
uh, first of all, are just simply to set the um, uh, set the public hearings. Uh, and so we're looking at setting the public hearings for all of these uh, on December 20th. Uh, the first one is with respect to the Brownfield plan. Uh, and by the way, our Brownfield consultant will be here uh, on the 20th, barring COVID or other <laughs> related issues, uh, uh, if not in person, certainly remotely, to uh, provide a little bit of a, of a more in-depth presentation. Uh, but the, the first item is regarding the Brownfield plan uh, that would allow for eligible activities to be reimbursed to the developer uh, and or the city. Uh, the second uh, one is uh, regarding the Obsolete Property Rehabilitation Act district and establishing a district so that then an exemption application can also be considered. And so similar to what the city did with respect to the Cadillac lofts for the commercial um, redevelopment district that we created as well as the application that we considered all at the same time we're doing the same thing here where we need to create a district as well as entertain or consider an application that has been filed with us for an eligible property within that district to receive the incentive um, the third item is then that application itself. Uh, and so the reason why we're doing this at the same time is because of the statutory requirements within this particular program that would restrict the ability for the developer to actually move forward with the development. And I probably should have started with this. The development itself, just in summary, is taking uh, what would be defined uh, as a functionally obsolete property, uh, essentially, or an obsolete property, a blighted obsolete property, turning it into a new mixed-use um, uh, development, which will be the home for, I believe, 14 residential rental lofts, uh, as well as a restaurant uh, and other restaurant-type commercial uses. Uh, the other part of the project, as well, includes uh, additional on-street parking, uh, excuse me, additional off-street parking to accommodate uh, people that wish to patronize uh, the, the new establishment. So uh, it's going to truly transform uh, that northern you know, area of our downtown corridor um, off of Bremer and Mitchell Streets and would not be possible if not for these types of incentives. Developments of this nature cannot happen unless they receive these types of programs that enable to make the, all of the, the budgets work and the numbers work. The cost of property coupled with the cost of materials uh, coupled with what market rents are don't add up to a viable project unless there is the ability for abatements and incentives to be put in place. Additionally, it's important to understand as well that in order for the developer to even be eligible to receive any form of assistance through the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, the city of Cadillac has to be engaged and essentially have uh, uh, the desire to see this type of project move forward. And the way that the state, um, uh, you know, wants to see that happen is through the local level approvals of these types of programs. And so uh, this requires the Cadillac Brownfield Authority uh, to be wanting to see this type of project move forward. It requires the Downtown Development Authority as well. One, because the project's located within that area, and two, because the Downtown Development Authority uh, needs to essentially take a waiver on their uh, proceeds that they otherwise would have been receiving over the duration that the brownfield is in place. Uh, and then of course it involves City Council. City Council has to then overall approve uh, the abatements that you're gonna have before you that we're gonna have the public hearing on presumably in a couple of weeks. So uh, again, it's one set of comments that covers all three 
you do need to take the items individually when you're considering the setting of the public hearings. Okay. I hear so, I've, I've heard more than once from um, plant managers or manufacturers housing, mm -hmm. housing, <laughs> and to have more uh, units available would be great. Um, I'll, I'll make a motion to adopt a resolution regarding Brownfield plan for the 423 North Mitchell redevelopment and set a public hearing for December 20th, 2021. Support. Councilmember Ingalls? Yes. King? Shippers? Yes. Alabas? Mayor Fulkin? Yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> and I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution regarding obsolete property rehabilitation district establishment for the 423 North Mitchell redevelopment and set a public hearing for December 20th, 2021. Support. Councilmember King, Shippers? Yes. Ellen Boss, Ingalls? Yes. Mayor Falcons? Yes. Motion carries. And I would make a motion to adopt the resolution regarding obsolete property rehabilitation act application for the 423 North Mitchell redevelopment and set a public hearing for December 20th, 2021. Support. Councilmember Shippers? Yes. Ellen Boss, Ingalls? Yes. King, Mayor Falcons? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. You're welcome. We're almost through. Okay. Uh, Mike. <laughs> Mike, you're still there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's plain solitaire. And it's just <laughs> still. Fun. His phone is his phone is <laughs> muted. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> we were just checking in on you. <laughs> no, I'm still here. Right. I got him. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, uh, members of the City Council. And uh, uh, following somewhat of a familiar theme, and, and this will likely be somewhat similar uh, at your next meeting as well as we go and actually have the public hearings, uh, I have uh, one set of comments uh, that uh, relate to uh, uh, both of the items. And so as uh, we talked earlier uh, this evening uh, regarding the uh, regulatory related uh, amendments that City Council considered uh, and then uh, post the public hearings approved. Uh, at the same time and along a parallel track, uh, there are the necessary zoning related uh, items that need to be also considered uh, and, and eventually approved in order for everything to, to sort of come together and work uh, in tandem with one another. Uh, to that end, uh, at the Planning Commission's last meeting, uh, they considered the uh, 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 zoning-related items, and they are uh, co-location, uh, stacked growers, uh, licensing, and uh, minimum distance requirements. And again, this is related to both the adult use of recreational and medical uh, marijuana ordinances or, or program that we have. Uh, the Planning Commission unanimously uh, approved uh, the recommendations that were set forth uh, and the recommendations set forth again that are very clearly outlined in the public packet uh, allow for the co-location uh, so you can have both uh, a, an adult use and a, a medical license at one site. You can stack licenses, uh, something that uh, before which was prohibited would, would not allow for you to have as a for instance a, a large cultivation facility with with dozens of licenses under one roof. You could also have as a, for instance, a processing license in that cultivation facility. Uh, that's something before wouldn't be allowed. And as uh, we have learned in, in, in just our sort of informal research, most cultivation facilities do have a processing facility in accordance with state law within a separate part of the building. Uh, and that's something that uh, we've heard would be of interest if, we're, if we are to have a cultivation facility here. Uh, minimum distance requirements as well. Uh, after much thought and looking at, again, how some other municipalities have done it, having an arbitrary distance between this type of use uh, and uh, any other use within the city we thought was not appropriate, given that there is no use, or excuse me, no spatial separation at all between any other use within our industrial park and any other part of the city. That being said, after careful uh, 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 consideration and, and diligent discussion with the Planning Commission, uh, they did amend that component as a part of their recommendation uh, to uh, require that 
the marijuana use within the industrial park uh, not be immediately adjacent uh, to any type of, of public or private educational institution or you know school and so that that is part of what is before you this evening and the recommendation would be to set the public hearings tonight uh, for those two zoning related ordinances for your December 20th meeting and um, we can certainly do a, a retread of that of course on the 20th as a part of the staff presentation but December 20th is going to be a yeah. big meeting yeah big meeting well they're all big you know but yeah <laughs> I thought the Planning Commission did a good job um, hashing this out and keeping the minimum distancing uh, mm -hmm. regulations. So, I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution to introduce ordinance to amend section 46-752 of the Cadillac City Code relating to recreational marijuana establishments and set a public hearing for December 20th, 2021. Support. Councilmember Allenbos, Ingalls. Yes. King. Shippers? Yes. Mayor Focus. Yes. Motion carries. And I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution to introduce ordinance to amend section 46-753 of the Cadillac City Code relating to medical marijuana facilities and to set a public hearing for December 20th, 2021. Support. Councilmember Ingalls? Yes. King? Shippers? Yes. Alabas? Mayor Focus. Yes. Motion carries. You know, when we first um, passed these ordinances, mm -hmm. I distinctly remember us saying that, you know, we were on the front end of doing this. And we said <coughs> that as we learn, as we get new information, we can always adjust and tweak as necessary. And I'm glad to see this coming forward that new information brings new um, policy, which is as it should be. I appreciate that, Councilmember Shippers and Mayor and um, Councilmember Engels. And as I mentioned earlier this evening, um, you know, we're not prepared this evening to present any new recommendations to City Council regarding the other license types, specifically the, the retail uh, types of licenses both medical and and recreational but you know we will be looking at what options might be appropriate for a council to look at down the road uh, it is important certainly that you know that we try to accommodate the the medical provisioning centers we have issued two licenses there hasn't been any movement uh, because of the, the issues that uh, were expressed earlier this evening uh, and you know we'll we'll certainly have some dialogue you know maybe this spring later this winter at some point in the future about how we should proceed should we proceed at all uh, in changing anything uh, or, or or tweaking anything and, and those are just conversations we're just not prepared to have yet tonight and so as I mentioned before sort of baby steps um, you know this was the the next thing on the list that we needed to to re-examine so okay all right uh, tonight we do have in our packets the minutes of the uh, elected officials compensation commission and y'all got a raise <laughs> we all got a raise so uh, we appreciate the work of the commission um, uh, so thank you for that and that will take us to our final public comment for this evening Well, it's getting about that time. Um, I do want to say thank you to council, city staff. These last couple of years have been trying times for everybody. COVID, thank you for your due diligence. Uh, we're still not out of the woods yet. Um, the county got a nice raise. Uh, the city employees, directors, etc. They deserve it too for what they have to go through. I think that's important. So bottom line is, uh, thank you. Uh, it's, you know, it's 100 years ago, we were going through some other pandemic, you know, and it's the more times change, the more things stay the same. But anyways, um, I do want to say one thing. I've been coming to council meetings for two to three years and I don't see what we're doing for the citizens of Cadillac. 
I mean, sure, we're doing improvements here and there, but it's all for the industry, all for business. I know, I know we have police, fire, good roads. Maybe we deserve a little tax break ourselves. You know, there's a lot of rental houses. I like to, you know, lumber's a, pretty high right now. I like to rehab a couple houses more. But with COVID and everything, I don't want nobody in my homes right now. But anyways, um, so that's about it. Oh, Robert, here's your ethics pledge. So, uh, thank you, Council. And like they say, smoke them if you got them. And I never inhaled either. I just want you to know that. Hello again. I would just like to uh, thank you for your comments uh, about considering the provisioning center retail establishment issue. And uh, I would appreciate uh, the council uh, having an open mind about the topic. Certainly, uh, there are other communities that have faced this choice as well. Uh, I would just reiterate that not proposing increasing the number of locations by any means, uh, just making it uh, a competitive market, as I think was the intent behind these ordinances. So thank you. Okay, seeing no one else, we'll close public comment and move to the good of the order, if anyone has anything this evening. Um, Mayor, members of the City Council, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief, and it's unfortunate. Um, <laughs> we had um, a resident, uh, I think, just step out, but I wanted to uh, address comments uh, that were just made to the City Council regarding, um, you know, what, what does the City Council do for our residents? And Drew, there was the correlation of of industrial incentives and commercial incentives um, and you know how does that help how does that help the people and um, I think it's important and I could probably pontificate about this for hours at a time and I won't but I think it's I think it's important to try to frame a, a basic understanding that the you know the city council the city organization uh, the things that we do we do in a in a manner to provide service to all of the constituents of the city in the best way possible. Um, we always look at, at ways to try to benefit um, the greater good in a sense, uh, and certainly by working towards improving our economy, by providing the ability for there to be more housing, for there to be more uh, commercial opportunities, whether it's restaurants or shops or stores or service businesses, by improving our own facilities, whether they're parks, lighting, lakes, sidewalks, you name it. You know, it's all, it's all related uh, to one another and it's all done in a manner to provide a sense of place, to provide a sense of community, um, to uh, not just, uh, you know, sustained value of property, property that's owned uh, by our citizenry, property that's owned by private business as well, but to sustain that property, to improve the value of that property in, in a lot of, uh, uh, of people's lives, the greatest asset that they own is their home. Uh, and so when a community, when a city takes the necessary steps forward to encourage economic development, encourage redevelopment, uh, you know, smart redevelopment and does so by providing incentives and working with other governmental agencies and partners. Uh, and that end game results in improved property values and in improved destination locations and better jobs and newer jobs and, and all of the things that come with it. Uh, that is directly how, you know, this body essentially gives back, you know, to, to the community. Um, and, you know, we, we try to, you know, make the right decisions um, as often as we possibly can uh, to, to get us there. So thank you for entertaining. Thanks for saying for that. Yep. That's, you know, that's always been my goal to, um, for the, to make this city that I love so much a place that my children want to be in and that 
my a good place to be in to raise a family, quality <coughs> of life, and all the decisions that we make here is for that. It's, so I appreciate you putting it so eloquently. Thanks, Marcus. Okay. Do you have anything else? Okay, nor do I. So we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you.